Please read with me. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come, for there is plenty. Listen carefully to God and delight in rich food that satisfies. Seek the Lord while God may be found. Call upon God who draws near. Let us pray together. Holy One, when we look at the world, our heart breaks. Inspire us to better care for the earth. Motivate us to pursue peace and stop violence that runs rampant. Empower us to stand against any who would co-opt your name and your words to justify hate. May we speak up calling out those who have harmed others in your name. Move us to pursue your call to justice, especially for the most vulnerable among us, for they are your beloved children. Help us to protect them, to love mercy, and to proclaim your reign is one of love and never of hate. Amen. They were bringing children to Jesus that Jesus might touch them, and the disciples scolded them. When Jesus saw it, he was frustrated and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. To such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child will not enter it. And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of our acceptance into the care of Christ's church, a sign and seal that we are beloved of God. God's very own and the beginning point of our faith journey. Friends, this is the water of baptism. So we'd ask these questions of our parents and our congregation. 
Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we do. Will you make known to your child the life example and teachings of Jesus that we claim to be a compelling way of life? And will you help her to follow his life example of teachings by being of good courage, holding fast to the good, rendering to no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, and by helping the afflicted, if so, please say, we will with the help of God. Will you encourage your child to help us build a community of relentless compassion and courageous hope where all are seen and known and the God of extravagant love is revealed? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. Will you help your child to welcome and value all people, regardless of beliefs or doubts, age, color, gender, orientation or identity, physical, mental or emotional ability, or economic status? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. As your child grows and matures, will you help her to deepen her faith through prayer, education, worship and service as they discern alone and with others the spirit's presence and guidance if so please say we will with the help of god we will with the help of god congregation would you stand as you are able in body or in spirit will you the members and friends of park congregational church united church of christ Promise your love, support, and care to this child about to be baptized this day and to her parents. If so, please say, we promise our love, support, and care. We promise our love, support, and care. On behalf of the members and friends of Park Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, I promise our love, support, and care to this child about to be baptized this day and to you, her parents. Please be seated. And would you join me in this prayer before baptism? Blessed by your Holy Spirit, gracious and loving God, this water, as it is sprinkled, may it mark this child as your beloved. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who makes us one. Amen. What is the full name of your child? Sylvia Unsing Trowbridge. Sylvia Unsing Trowbridge. Can I hold you for a sec? Yeah, we're not so sure. <laughs> not totally so. Look at all those people. Wow. Look at all those people. Yeah. All right, so we're going to let mom hold you while you're baptized. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. It's just beautiful. <laughs> Sylvia Unsing Trowbridge. I baptize you in the name of the God the Creator. Of God the Redeemer. And God the Sustainer. Join me in our prayer together. Gracious and loving God, give to the newly baptized strength for life's journey, courage in time of suffering, the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life through Jesus the Christ who makes us one. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Blessed are you, O God, our creator and redeemer. At the work of your hand, we give thanks for all things bright and beautiful, all things great and small, and for the many ways in which you touch our lives with your steadfast love. As we gather for worship, keep us in your grace and peace this day, and teach us to glorify and enjoy you forever. Holy One, we have been on this journey for a few weeks now. It began on Ash Wednesday when we received the admonition to repent and believe the good news of the gospel. And if repentance charges us to move in a new direction, one that admits our self-centeredness and confesses our prejudices, we need your guidance to find that new direction and the courage to follow it. Our fragmented lives and self-concern constantly pull at our intentions, unsettling our faith and diluting our commitment. We want to repent and believe. We want to embark on that change that will help us follow you more nearly. May we look to Jesus how he lived and loved, and find our direction by following his way, which is a way of care and compassion, a way of hospitality and welcome, and a way of seeking and an invitation to that table of grace reserved for all, regardless of condition. Healing God, whose perfect will for us is salvation, that shalom of wholeness of body and mind which brings us into harmony with all that you have created. Many of us feel far away from, from that kind of salvation as we are feeling so much loss during these days of disease and illness. Encourage those who are in despair, support the lonely, comfort the grieving, and heal those battling disease of body and soul. And, O oh God, we pray for those fighting for their lives and a free country in Ukraine. Continue to give them courage and strength to endure in their struggle. May a way be found forward to achieve that day of peace and justice soon. And we pray that you will give us hearts to reach out to the least, the last, and the lost with hands of compassion even as we pray in the name of the one who has shown us the way of love and who taught us to pray to our creator who is like a caring mother and loving father as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else they will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Our second reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Remember, we started this conversation a few weeks ago in response to a teenager's question, are there better reasons for believing than just trying to escape hell? And over the last couple of weeks, we have talked about how being part of of a community means that we're not alone, and that the choice of how we live may have more to do with the present than with some pie in the sky by and by. Those are good reasons for believing, and maybe they're enough, but there is yet another reason that can be offered up, and this one is so positive that sometimes it is perceived as negative. Friends, when you come into this church, when you come into the sanctuary of Park Church, you consistently hear a gospel of grace, the good news of welcome, the gentle words of acceptance. Now, because Many of us have had the opposite experience of condemnation and judgment. Those words wash over us like a cleansing of warm water, bathing us so that we see ourselves as as clean and acceptable, valued and loved. Now, we all agree this is a great thing, and it is one of the joys and the privileges of of ministry to witness that kind of of life-changing experience. But you're a thinking congregation, and you do not accept even the most hopeful message without critique. And so I know you would resonate with the question put to me by a parishioner in a previous congregation, is God too tolerant? Can this wonderful message of love and and acceptance becomes so rosy that it begins to sound like nothing more than happy talk. Well, that is where 
we continue our conversation this morning. Are, are we just kidding ourselves and inventing the kind of religion that we would like when reality keeps whispering to us that this is nothing more than an illusion? Now, the truth is that while we preach a gospel of grace and unconditional love, it is often seen as a slippery slope leading into the land of anything goes. Now, any parent knows that while we love our children dearly, the results will be disastrous if we raise them without limits. And of course, the favorite speech that every parent has heard is, you don't trust me. It's the old question of, of where do love and the law meet? Paul Ramsey was an ethical mentor to several generations of students at Union Theological Seminary in New York. And he would often give them the following advice. If everything is permitted, which Christian love permits, then everything is demanded which Christian love requires. So let others say anything goes. The Christian asks, what does love require? Now admittedly, this is a little bit of inside baseball because from the outside, from up there in the stands, it looks like God is just lobbing a bunch of softballs to the plate, making it easy for, for everyone to hit a home run. Now, of course, if that was really true, it would minimize the skills of the players and make a farce out of the game. While in the game of life, such cheap grace would be offering a, a sloppy and a sentimental kind of love and certainly not the kind of robust and muscular love that we find in the Christ of the cross. Now from the outside, unconditional love looks like it can easily be taken advantage of. The, the Apostle Paul asks the question on the minds of, of all who are used to looking for an angle. Are we to sin that grace may abound. And certainly from, from the outside, it looks like such a message is, is nothing more than a get out of jail free card with no expiration date. One of the ancient church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, characterized the life of a monk as having three stages. At the beginning, God is served out of fear like a slave. And next, the service of God stems from a desire for reward, like that of a, of a hired hand. And only in the final stage does a person serve God out of friendship with God as a child of God's own household. The significant point is that the love of God is conceived as something that is to be learned over a long period of time. And this kind of love is anything but sloppy and sentimental. In fact, it's demanding. It's sacrificial. If the life of Christ has any meaning at all, it shows how unconditional love provokes a response of loyalty rather than license, of sacrifice rather than sentimentality. We, be, we began with the question, is God too tolerant? And, and while that question entertains us with, with interesting speculation, we're quickly led to realize that this isn't as much about God as it is about us. Well, we can talk about the nature of God and attach all of those omnis, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, but the rubber meets the road when all, for all of us when we examine what happens to us when we touch the very core of God's being, unconditional love. Which brings us to one of my favorite New Testament characters, Zacchaeus, the tax collector from Jericho. Now, some of you who actually remember sermons 
will remember that I mentioned Zacchaeus last fall, but I'm not finished with him yet. Zacchaeus becomes important to us because he is the prototype for all for whom life hasn't quite turned out the way they had expected and who want something more, even though they might not be sure what it is. Frederick Beekner minces no words when he describes Zacchaeus as a sawed-off little social disaster with a big bank account and a crooked job. <laughs> now, a more kindly and perhaps more accurate description would be that, that Zacchaeus indeed was short of, of stature, perhaps no more than five feet tall. And if being a social disaster meant that he was the least popular person in Jericho, that was most likely true since his role as tax collector for Rome put him in the position of taking his neighbor's money and giving it to the hated occupiers. And beyond that, he became a very wealthy man in the process because his own cut was rather lucrative. Now, now the image, the image of, of a guy like this climbing a tree to see over the heads of a crowd is the stuff of comedy. Now we can imagine the crowd virtually locking arms so as not to let him get any kind of, of view from ground level. And so Zacchaeus resorted to the humiliation of climbing a tree. And you can almost hear the, the snickers and the barbs of ridicule being thrown at him. But then, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus and something amazing happens. Jesus calls out his name. Zacchaeus. Hey, I, I see you up there. Come on down and let's talk. Think of it. You're watching a parade and the grand marshal picks you out of the crowd by calling your name. It sounds like an honor, doesn't it? And it would be for many of us, but Zacchaeus, at least initially, may have thought of it differently. For, for now, the focus of attention is turned upon him, and the ridiculousness of his predicament is unveiled, and what is more, he's outed. He's outed by Jesus as a closet believer exposed as one who wanted to change his life, but didn't know how. Now, we look around us, don't we, all the time, and we make judgments about people, don't we? It's only natural. The clothes they wear, the cars they drive, the, the houses they, they live in, the jobs that they have or, or don't have, and sometimes those judgments are are more than superficial, they may be based on experience. A slight, an angry exchange, disappointment, being at the opposite ends of the political spectrum. You've heard it said that God looks on the heart, but our technology doesn't allow us to, to go that far. All we know is what we see and experience. And the people of Jericho would have known that the name Zacchaeus meant righteous one, clean, innocent, upright. <laughs> and what a joke they must have thought. If that's what his parents saw in him, they must have been sorely disappointed. But then, then Jesus comes to town and calls his name Zacchaeus, righteous one, clean, innocent, upright. Jesus saw something that is true about every one of us. We want to live up to our name. We want to live up to our name, but we don't know how our lives are broken or they may have taken a detour. They haven't turned out the way we, we wanted them to and we don't know how to right the ship. But then, Jesus comes to town. 
and calls out our name. I know who you are. I know what you are made of because I come in the name of the one who created you and knows you and loves you. And so Jesus headed off to the home of Zacchaeus for lunch. Wouldn't it have been great to have been a fly on the wall and heard that conversation? Now, whatever was said, we know what happened, and it was fairly impressive. Zacchaeus promised to give 50% of his wealth to the poor and to pay back at a rate of four to one all of the cash that he had extorted from everyone else. Now, those of you who have been raised in the Roman Catholic tradition are way ahead of us here because you were raised with a category of spiritual discipline that, that we Protestants threw out during the Protestant Reformation, and it's called an act of contrition. An act of contrition. Oh, we, we kept the idea of, of repentance. It's important to say you're sorry. It's important to confess your sins, but somewhere along the line, we uncoupled that from an act of contrition. Now, an act of contrition is more than just saying, I will try to do better. I want to do better. I, I need to do better. It's a concrete response. It's a concrete response that shows that you mean it. And that is what Zacchaeus was doing here. Literally putting his money where his mouth was. You see, sometimes we get this matter of God's tolerance and God's love mixed up. While God's love gives us freedom, it also compels us to use that freedom responsibly. And therefore, I want to suggest that a better reason for believing is that you want to change your life. You want to go in a different direction. You're, you're tired of the, of the petty little secrets. You're tired of feeling that you have to shave your ethics in order to get by. You want to be made whole and to have your life be congruent with your best self. Now, I know, I know there's a school of thought out there that says people don't change. We are who we are, so, so suck it up and get used to it and somehow turn it to your advantage so that you can survive in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. Now, that's, that's a message, but that is not the Christian message. In fact, there's some psychological truth there, but it's not Christian truth. I'm the grateful product of a father who changed, who resisted all of the predictors of who he should be and what he should be based on, on background and circumstances and education. And he used to tell me and my brother that all of his early friends were either dead or in jail. What happened? He said, I asked God to help me. And God did. You see... The best reason for believing is that you want to change your life. Yes, every day is a battle. Every day is a struggle for, for change, the AA philosophy of one day at a time. But in that battle, we have the assurance that God wants us to win and not to lose, and it comes down to this. What is there in your life that gets in the way of, of who you are and who you are meant to be? What is there in the business of living that obscures who you know God wishes you to be? Now, for most of us, it's no secret. It does not require uh, painful and expensive analysis. It just involves us in an act that will help us make a start. That will help us make a start in changing the direction of our lives. An act of contrition. 
At the very least, each of us knows enough to ask God to help us to help ourselves. And so, friends, if you're seeking to do that, if you want to make contrition work for you, then you will make this prayer your own. Help me, Lord, to become the master of myself that I might become the servant of others. Take my hands and work through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take my mind and think think through it. And take my heart and set it on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. And may it be so.
been an honor to be with you in worship this morning. Thanks to all who have contributed to our service today. Would you join me in our common commission, sending us into the world to be people of light, love, and yes, grace. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, rendering to no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all people, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Thank you. 